Hey older guys, good afternoon. Welcome back to the Black Jersey. My name's Max and I'm the host of this channel. The All Blacks vs Ireland series is just six days away from the day of this upload, so things are seriously heating up, and I'm going to be diving into some of the tactics we could potentially see that could decide the series. I'm gonna break the video into each individual section, but before we start, a big thank you to my patrons, and if you're liking my content, please hit the subscribe button and hit the notification bell. Um, this idea for the video was also kind of inspired by what Hacker Time Rugby, um, hosted by Zach, was doing. He explained the um, processes of this all very, very well, so a shout out to Hacker Time Rugby. I'm going to kind of go beneath the surface. I'm going to look a bit deeper though, so have a contest and see which one of us did this analysis better. First off, we're going to go into the coaches. So to kick things off, Ireland has Andy Farrell as their head coach. Um, Andy Farrell is known by some of you as the father of Owen Farrell, who for five years was the best player in the world at two positions, whereas others will know Andy Farrell as the guy who masterminded the Irish and British and Irish Lions blitz defence, which has um, been very difficult for the All Blacks to deal with ever since 2016. Um, Ireland have played 24 tests for Farrell, and they've lost lost just six for him, so he has the highest ever win percentage for an Irish head coach with 75%. A uh, quite interesting takeaway though is that all but one of these six losses have been away from home. The exception to this rule was a home defeat to France in 2021 without a crowd, and this was only decided by 13 to 15 um, being the scoreline. Um, so Ireland have only played away in eight from 24 tests that Andy Farrell has taken them for. So um, yeah, um, the Irish going to New Zealand, getting away from home, getting out of this bubble, I think is going to be very important to their World Cup hopes, as France, the home nation um, for the World Cup, does seem to be the current Irish lot's kryptonite. The All Blacks, on the other hand, have Ian Foster. Um, they've played 21 tests for Fozzie, they've drawn one test, and they've lost five for him. So Fozzie's win percentage is 71.43%, and this is the worst win percentage for an All Blacks coach since Wayne Smith in 2000 and 2001. Um, Foster is just one of two All Black coaches with a win rate below 75% since Eric Watson in 1980 for the All Blacks. The All Blacks, though, have had to win away from home quite a lot. They've played just 7 of 21 tests at home for Foster, and all of their losses have been away from home. So the All Blacks have kind of learned to travel very strongly, whereas the Irish are going to have to learn how to do this ahead of the World Cup. We're now going over to Ireland's attack, and their attack coach is a guy called Mike. Cat. Some people may know Mike Cat for this. Man, Lobu. He's still on his feet. Lobu could score. And others may know Mike Cat for this. In all seriousness, though, I think that the fact that Andy Farrell being a defense coach. Um, has meant he's kind of had to get one of the best attack coaches in the world on board, and Mike Cat is a far better coach than he was as a player. Um, after all the traumatising events from the All Blacks in the 90s, he went on to play 75 tests for England, and he's become a very successful coach. Some of the passions in the attack from Ireland we're seeing from Mike Cat had been very inventive, and Ireland's use of decoy runners inside their opponent's half has become a massive staple of the Andy Farrell era. They can sometimes overpass when they don't need to though. Um, Ireland though, they really kick. They've scored tries just twice 
off kicks in the last 12 months. The first of those was Hugo Keenan against the USA uh, Tier 2 Nation. The other was very entertaining. It was Mac Hansen catching the kickoff for his first ever Irish try. So yes, Ireland have been compared to the new All Blacks quite a lot lately because of this very brilliant attack. For the most part, however, decoy runners and skip passes have been incredibly common sources for the Irish scoring their tries. We saw the use of a decoy runner in their first ever try for Andy Farrell against Scotland. This decoy usage though was a lot more subtle than it is today. It begins with a pass off the base of the ruck from James Ryan, the lock. Kian Healy looks to set for a crash ball run, but turns around to pass behind to Connor Murray, who is freed up from halfback as an extra distributor. Jordan Lama then comes in as a decoy runner, with Murray passing to Johnny Sexton as Lama runs the dummy line. Sexton runs towards the outside and outpaces Blair Kinghorn to run in for the try, while Sean Maitland doesn't even bother to make the tackle. Today's usage of the decoy runner by Ireland, however, um, it's far, far less subtle. In just the third minute against Wales, they run a few passes with the forwards and then do a total 180. Jamison Gibson Park, the new halfback, gives the pass away to Tideburn who then goes behind to Johnny Sexton. With Welsh defenders taking Ronan Kelleher's decoy line as bait, Sexton then passes to Mac Hansen with Caelan Doris's dummy line also causing indecision for the Welsh. Hansen, despite being Australian born, doesn't give away an indecision pass and um, he's worked from his wing into centre and skip passes James Lowe to give the try assist to Bundy Aki who is on the wing rather than centre as a crash ball clean out option out wide or um, just for whatever reason if the play is red. Though this looks to be a simple try, there's clearly been a lot of rehearsal that's gone into this try. The reason they make these skip passes is so that opposition don't always see the intended Irish strike runners coming onto the ball at pace. I'm also going to touch on the shape of Ireland's pods um, in their forward pack before we move on to the All Blacks defence. The Irish typically have a pod shape of a 1-3-2-2, and uh, the one is often Jack Conan, their number eight. Jack Conan isn't particularly good, and when he's in tight channels, he often just takes the ball into contact. However, when he's out wide, he can be used as a clean-out option in rucks to protect the winger from concealing the turnover, whereas out wide Conan is a far more effective runner of the ball. And so I think that Ian Foster has possibly put the most thought into any All Black selection since the 2015 World Cup. The selection of Peter Gus Sawakula and Hoskin Satutu is a possible idea to back up Akira Iwani, who has been a bit injury prone this season, hence the omission of Luke Jacobson. Jacobson, as I've said before, may May be a better player than Peter Gus Sawakula, but the inclusion of Sawakula, I'm thinking, is more than likely tactical. Should Yuani go down, either Satutu or Sawakula can come into the starting 15 and manmark Conan in the wise channels should Ireland's shape be a 1-3-2-2. For this particular defensive tactic, the All Blacks have used Cody Taylor and Dane Coles as the one from a 1-3-2. So that way those two can use their running ability and clean out. However, they may look to use Yawani in this role this time. The All Blacks defense as well guys is pretty good as of late. I'm going to run through some tackle percentages for the Rugby Championship last year and the All Blacks made 703 out of 799 tackles for a rate of 88% in the Rugby Championship. Australia's rate, um, 565 out of 639, so that was an 88% ratio as well. South Africa made more tackles in Australia but less than the All Blacks. They made 628 out of 744 for a ratio of 84%, whereas Argentina made the most tackles but just had 85%. So though the All Blacks had the second to largest sample size, um, I think their defence could be very good at high holding the Irish out due to some very good tackle accuracy. Moving on to the All Blacks attack though, 
I'm not gonna lie, it's kind of, well, not very good. As you can see, a lot of the attack patterns that you're seeing from the All Blacks these days are quite literally just more advanced variations of hands down the line, the kind of stuff that you do in primary and intermediate school here in New Zealand. Um, the All Blacks assistant coach in charge of the attack is Brad Moore, and with the Crusaders he created a very free-flowing, offload heavy style of attack that the All Blacks just don't seem to have nowadays. Um, they played 15 tests in 2021, four of those were against tier 2 nations, um, two were against Fiji, one versus Tonga, one versus the USA. From those four games against tier 2 nations, they scored 50 tries, which means the remaining 51 tries they scored in 2021 came from 11 tests against tier 1 nations. Of those 51 tries against other tier 1 nations, we see quite a similar thing to the Irish, because just 6 of these tries were constructed through some kind of kick in the lead up. These were Geordie Barrett vs Australia in Perth, George Bridge also vs Australia in Perth, um, the kick and try assist came off TJ Petanara, Sever Reese against um, South Africa in the second test against them. We also saw Will Jordan become the only player for the All Blacks to score off his own chip kick um, and he did this twice against both Ireland and Wales whereas Sevu Reese um, also did get a try off a kick against Wales. Now we're moving on to Ireland's defence and I'm going to point out the fact that the All Blacks are the only tier 1 nation in the last 12 months that have genuinely constructed a try against Ireland rather than just either get lucky or capitalise off errors. Because in the last 12 months, Ireland have conceded just 4 tries to their opponents in the 6 nations. They've conceded tries in just 6 matches in general in the last 12 months. Japan scored their only try against Ireland under advantage. This one was a simple case of Kazuki Himeno standing flat and running through a hole, then passing on to Fafita for the try. Um, there's really not much analysis to be done here, it's just a case of um, a defender misreading a play. It's then the same case of defensive misreads when Argentina scored their only try against Ireland. The forwards made two offloads allowing Mateo Carreras to be in space thanks to an overlap, defensive miscommunication from the inexperienced Ryan Beard and also Connor Murray, then allows Carreras to step back inside and score with just three minutes on the clock. No need for much analysis on Tane Basham's score for Wales against Ireland either, it's a simple attacking miscommunication. Wales were only able to score thanks to Basham reading a pass off the ground that probably, in all honesty, never should have happened. Once again, against France is a defensive misread by Hugo Keenan against France as Jack Conan has already began tackling Romain Entomac. Keenan leaves the hole open so Entomac can send Dupont in to score untouched. France's second try, pretty simple as well, it's a pick and go against Ireland from about 3 metres to the try line. And finally, Scotland's only points against Ireland in the 2022 Six Nations does not require a lot, a lot of analysis either. It's a simple case of Scotland being patient with ball in hand and Pierce Schumann driving over the line from a few metres out after 11 phases of play. So. As we've looked through Ireland's defence, we can see that the only way to score against them is to pretty much wait for a defensive misread or just, you know what, construct something and work hard to read their game plan, which Will Jordan and Dalton Papali'i, as you can see, both did very well. I've spoken on these two tries in a player analysis for Papali'i and a player analysis for Jordan, so you can see the full things by clicking the links in the description. Just one thing I've forgot to add there guys, so because of Ireland's rush defence, they want us to have a crash ball running 12. As they're leaving a lot of space in the backfield, it's allowing them to push more defenders into their main line. Hence why David Havili is so important, because his kicking game can unlock the space left in behind um, the huge, huge vacuum they've left behind the main defensive line. Sorry, just forgot to add this part in there, but oh well. 
The last thing I'm going to talk about for this video is the set piece between each nation. The All Blacks have lost possession, um, the percentage of possession through the match, in four of their five losses under Ian Foster. France is the exception, it's the only match the All Blacks have won in the last um, two or so years with the majority of possession. The All Blacks have then lost the ruck percentage in three of their five losses under Ian Foster. Australia is the exception to this one while they tied with Argentina. The All Blacks have lost the lineup percentage in just two of the five losses where the scrum it was just one of the five losses. For Ireland, they can lose while dominating the set piece though. Ireland's won the possession percentage in all of their six losses for Farrell. Against um, one of these nations you can even see 68% or so. Ireland have lost the ruck percentage in just two of their six losses, same with the line out, just two of the six again. They also lost just two scrums against opponents in losses for Andy Farrell. Both were against England in 2020, they lost the scrum percentage that day. So as you can see, both teams pretty much need the ball to win matches. Though, what happens with Ireland is that if you defend against them very well, you can pretty much shut them down. So the answer to doing that is reading their decoy runs and reading their kicking game. Whereas Ireland should be fearful of the All Blacks unleashing a kicking game. It's quite clear that Ian Foster knows a kicking game will determine the 2023 Rugby World Cup, hence his continued selection of David Havili, who has well and truly ended the debate between himself, Geordie Barrett and Roger Tuivasa-Shek, as Geordie Barrett Guys, you know I think he's the best 15 in the world. What I think is going to happen in this series, the All Blacks are going to come in and they're going to win because the Irish are a bit too tired after a long season. We lost to them last year for the very same reason. What's going to happen though is that Ireland are seriously going to outthink the All Blacks and I wouldn't be surprised if a kick at goal from Geordie Barrett is what wins us the series. What I think is going to happen in conclusion is that the Irish will lose the first two tests due to the All Blacks having a far better side. The All Blacks are going to bring out a few debutants for the third. The Irish will get a consolation victory. So my final prediction is that the All Blacks will win by 2-1 to one, and the Irish will break the record for the first home win against the All Blacks. Wellington, after all, does seem to be the place where the All Blacks tend to lose at home and that's where the third test is. So thank you very much for watching this video guys. It's been a real pleasure to host the video. Make sure to check out my Patreon and my PayPal tip jar if you want to make a financial donation. I've also got my own website for opinion journalism. Support me on Instagram so I can hit 16,000 followers before the series begins and I am also on Twitter so check me out there for a bit of banter and stuff like that. All good guys. Much appreciated. Go the All Blacks. Best of luck to the Irish as well. And I will see you next time. Thank you team.